There's a very significant chapter in the long history of the Hubble Space Telescope that I had never found written up anywhere. You could find a few scholarly tomes about all the bureaucratic warfare from the early 1960s to the mid-late 1970s that led to Hubble actually being approved and funded by Congress and starting to get built. You could find a lot on the other end of the story about all the magnificent images and astronomical discoveries. But oh my God, they discovered the mirror was flawed, but thank heavens they fixed it and on we go to the glorious pictures. None of that is false, but it leaves a bit out about, oh, thank heavens they fixed it. There's not a space telescope aisle in any hardware store. You just easily go by and pick up the tools that you're going to need. 300 miles above the Earth, whizzing around at 17,500 miles an hour, with the repairs being done by people who are wearing the equivalent of double snowmobile suits, triple mittens, and buckets on their head. So somewhere along the way in that gap that hasn't been written about, some people needed to apply an awful lot of foresight and then invention and creativity and, and careful engineering to actually imagine how do you do that and then what gear and gadgets do you actually need to go do it in orbit and how does that need to be adapted. Well, that work, and, and in particular the bit about making sure you actually have the gear and equipment that makes this prospect of maintenance a reality, uh, that work got done in a five-year block of time from 1985 to 1990. I worked alongside those engineers, unsung engineers, uh, from the Lockheed Martin Corporation and different parts of NASA. They are to Hubble what the Hidden Figures computer ladies are to the John Glennon early Mercury story, the people whose work is absolutely indispensable to how it all came out right, but whose names have essentially never been mentioned, and stories of how they uh, came to be clever enough to do that never told. So filling in this missing chapter of history so that people could appreciate the role that engineering foresight and inventiveness and a focus on maintenance, those three things play a huge role in why Hubble is the twice its lifetime success that it is. So let's actually go back six years before that to your first space flight. And what's it like to wake up in space? You know, most of us, I think, were awake and rousing about a bit mm. before Mission mm. Control Center officially was allowed to start communicating with us again. And you'd hear there's a distinctive tone that would signal mm -hmm. there's a radio link opening up. And then they'd just start some music running, kind of like your alarm clock mm -hmm. waking you up gracefully in the morning. And when they finished, they'd, uh, the voice would come up the loop, usually saying something innocent like, you know, Challenger, good morning, Houston, standing by. And then they'd leave you to go about your coffee mm -hmm. and your rest of your wake-up ritual, unless something was really very pressing. And how does this space compare with the amount of crew space there was on a shuttle? Oh, vastly larger. The stage is a closer comparison. But three stories, three uh, decks two. of it? Two decks there's, of there's it. There's two decks and a main, only a maintenance space. So it's a pretty intimate sort of space. Cozy, yeah, very cozy. <laughs> Except, you know, it's not, it is two floors, but, you know, you've got a lot more room in it because you don't have to have your feet on the floor. So if this is feeling a little crowded, we'll just put you up there. You know, right, but you actually got to go outside, which is something that yes. I... Um, Tell us a little bit about that spacewalk. You were working on refueling a, a satellite? Yeah, the shuttle was uh, advertised as being able to uh, put, launch, carry things into orbit, but also either retrieve them or repair them in orbit or refuel them. And so we got the assignment that was focused on, well, let's prove you can actually refuel. Uh, the easy part was, you know, can you make two couplings that will go together and let liquid go back and forth? The tricky bit was the propellant, the fuel that all satellites, pretty well all satellites maneuver with, is super toxic and super explosive. No one who owns a satellite is going to consider us a credible refueling service if we've never actually done refueling with this real nasty propellant. That's what, hydrazine? Hydrazine. Yeah. So for one thing, if you squeeze more hydrazine into a tank that already has some in it, if you do that too quickly, you know, raising the pressure in the tank raises the temperature in the tank. And there's a really rather low temperature that if you push hydrazine to that temperature, it will just spontaneously explode with no added help. So you've got to have your thermodynamics right, and you've got to have good control over how quickly you're adding new hydrazine in. Uh, and this experiment let us do some of that thermodynamics mm -hmm. experiments. And then the other thing is, because it's so toxic and so nasty, uh, do you really have the equipment that will let astronauts open up a fuel tank that's already got hydrazine in it? put a fuel line in that also has hydrazine in it and be confident they won't get contaminated on their suits. Or mm -hmm. If you get contaminated on the outside of a spacesuit, you're safely sealed inside. 
but you come back into an airlock with some of that stuff on the outside, and you repressurize the airlock. All the little hydrazine frost on the outside of your suit will go into the vapor in the air. I mean, about a fingernail's worth of hydrazine ice, if it circulated back into the shuttle's cabin, was reckoned would at least sicken everyone and possibly be more da dangerous than that. The challenge was, I want you to refill the gas tank on your car without ever touching the gas tank. The clever engineering problem we had to solve for that was, how do you make a gadget that will let you do that? Sounds absolutely terrifying. So it took you three and a half hours, yes? You were working yeah. presumably with a partner? Yes, that, it was a, which is quite short by spacewalk standards, actually. But uh, that was the confines of our test. And then there was a, a fairly minor problem with one of the space shuttle's antennas that we need to do, needed to do a bit of an adjustment to as well. All flights are great flights. You want to fly as soon as possible, as long as possible. High inclination to see as much of the Earth as possible. And rule number five is get a spacewalk if you possibly can. Mm -hmm. And only a quarter to a third of, of people who become astronauts actually ever end up outside on the spacewalk. I mean, to get to put on your very own body-shaped spaceship, your pilot in command of your own spaceship, uh, and move around in the flexibility of zero gravity, not in a water tank where you can simulate it pretty well, but actually with the planet going by right up there, uh, and then have always pretty fascinating, challenging and fascinating work to do. It's a very coveted thing to get to do if you're the kind of people we are. Thank you.